Well, hello, lovely listeners. Um, today we've got, well, it's my honor to have the wonderful Amanda Purbidi with me today. Amanda is my yoga teacher. And um, I met Amanda, crikey, I think it was about three or four years ago. And um, when I used to go to a different yoga teacher and Amanda is very good friends with Rita. And when Rita moved away, Amanda took over her class and that's how I started to be in Amanda's space a lot more. And Amanda is, well, she, she does her own podcast. She does um, uh, blogs and wonderful, and is a wonderful storyteller. I love reading Amanda's stories and I love listening to her podcasts. And uh, she's very magical. She's very spiritual and she's just a wonderful person to be around and very calming and um, just very in tune with everything. So Amanda's had... Um, some amazing experiences over her lifetime and I just thought it'd be brilliant to get her on so she could share maybe some of her magic with you guys. So welcome Amanda. Thank you. <laughs> so um, I think for what I'd love you to do is just let the listeners know really um, a little bit about you, you know, in terms of you know, you've had a bit of a weavy, weavy pathway, a, a weavy journey as we all have, and I, and I know you're certainly someone that's not settling for second best. You're certainly getting more into your own being, that your own who you are, and that's very evident to me. So it would be great for you to maybe give the listeners a little bit of a backstory and, um, and let them know who you are. Yeah, okay. How far do you want me to go? Do you want me to start with how I got into yoga or right back? Um, I think, yeah, maybe how you got into yoga to start with and then and then let's see where where we go after that yeah okay well I, I love the theme of this podcast about not settling and to be honest I was someone that really did settle and couldn't ever imagine myself being someone that was uh, stepping out of the comfort zone because I'd had a really hard life I'd had um even in Coventry, I have been here about 15 years. I, I counted eight, my partner asked me the other day how many times I've moved house. It's about 15. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've had a lot of shifts and changes. But the reason that I got into teaching yoga, it, it was definitely because of the universe or whatever you would call that unseen power that threads behind everything. And I worked at the co-op. Um, I ran the little beds department there and there was just one day, I can still remember it now, where this thought kept coming into my mind, is this it? Is this my life? And I felt comfortable, I felt secure, I had enough money coming in, I was well respected. It was quiet, so I could sneakily read at times and the staff were lovely. But this one day, the thought kept coming and I remember afterwards I went to the library just to take a book back and I, I love libraries I just sit and soak in the books but this one particular day I just felt immobilized and I remember just sitting looking at the books and it felt like I was just distanced from everything and my head kept wondering what's wrong um, I always felt dissociated from myself and then a text came through from Rita, um, mine and Mel's yoga teacher at the time, and she just said, I keep thinking about you, it's something to do with work and yeah, just how are you, message me, let me know if you're okay, let's meet for coffee and I messaged her back and just said, I don't know if I'm okay, I, I seem like I'm not okay, although in my head I am, but something else in me isn't, yeah, let's meet. And then shortly later, a man walked past me, um, an older man, and he just stopped in front of me and just said, what are you thinking? And, um, and I, my first thoughts were like, oh, no. <laughs> you know, the kind of person that wants to chat to you in the library and you're like, <laughs> what's your motives? And um, so I just tried to fob him off and said, oh, well, it's just been one of those days. And he wouldn't be fobbed off and he said to me again, so what are you thinking? And then yoga talks about the koshas, like you have different levels of your being and your mind and something deeper or higher 
must have spoke because my mind wasn't connected to that part at all but it was a part of me and there's a part of me that just said I feel like I want to be self-employed and my head freaked out I was like what no you don't what are you on about so yeah I feel like I want to teach yoga I want to be a Reiki practitioner I want to run meditation I want to be a holistic healer um but I'm scared and he said well do you have a teacher is anyone you could ask about this who could support you do you do these practices I was like yeah all of the above thinking gosh my teacher just texted me about work and so he just talked to me about how it takes lots of little steps to step into this place that your heart is calling to you, you to that frightens you so much and he's like, start voluntary, just do something, help somebody out within this field, ask your teacher for support. I'm sure they would like your support, blah, 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 blah. And he just gave me step after step. And then he was like, eventually you'll feel so full of what you're doing that you have to branch into self-employed because you can't keep both worlds going at the same time. And then I was like, who are you? Like, why are you here? How do you know exactly what to ask me? I suppose like Mel does with these interviews, asking the right questions. And what the heck is it in me that was ready, so ready to speak that my whole being ground to a halt? It was utterly mesmerizing and yoga talks about these things, but I didn't know about it at the time. So part of me thought, is he a guide? Is he an angel? Is he real? I've never seen him since. I phoned Rita on the way out and I just told her what had happened and she said, wow, okay, well, firstly, everything in me resonates with this. Let's start a meditation group together. You can use my yoga room anytime I'm not teaching. You can use it to do Reiki. You can practice teaching yoga, blah, 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 blah. The universe just opened door after door after door. Um, but it kind of ground to a halt when it got to the point that my mum passed away. So my whole family passed away within a short period of time. My mum was like my soulmate, my friend, my best friend. She was everything because I have no siblings. And um, I felt incredibly disempowered. And again, it was in that time when I was at the most disempowered, like my body was caving in. I I was struggling with my gut so much that I couldn't even catch buses anywhere. I was having to be driven places. It was such a disempowering time. Even though spiritually I was doing well, my body was collapsing in and, and this voice inside of me just kept saying, take back your power. And I had no idea what that meant. And it was about two weeks later that I went to a new yoga class and I met the teacher and he spoke about his teacher training just like I'd spoken to the man in the library that I wanted to be a yoga teacher. Didn't feel like I could because my body was a wreck. Um, so who was I to teach yoga when I couldn't even catch a bus or go to a shop without panicking? And this teacher looked at me and he said, you know, being a yoga teacher isn't about being perfect. It's not about performing. It's about taking back your power. And he spoke my sentence. And I knew in that moment, I didn't know how it was going to be possible. I had to do that teacher training. And ever since, it's like door after door after door has opened. And sometimes people can look at my life and they're like, oh my gosh, she must have it so together. She must be organized. I mean, Mel knows I'm not. Um, but somehow, with who I am, with my weaknesses, with my strengths, with all of my past, with all of it, my gifts, everything, the universe knows who I am, what I'm capable of, and the right doors open. And it happens again and again and again. And so now here I am, surviving in this time of lockdown quite well, teaching online when I didn't even have Wi-Fi before the start of lockdown. You know, it's just like, everything's just kind of come into place. It's never a smooth road. I know you guys are probably smiling at that because it never is. Um, and when it is, it's not for long, but I've just got this underlying trust that through it all, even the roughest bits, sometimes that's when the biggest miracles come along. It's just, you gotta just kind of hang on in there and don't worry about your weaknesses because I had so many and still have 
and the universe isn't phased by that at all and in fact if we think we have to be strong and perfect before these life-changing things happen before we step out on our own and we take these risks then we'll spend our whole life scared because we can't keep all the plates turning we can't if you think you have to be strong enough and perfect enough you will always have fear and it's when we drop into that place of trust and knowing that we're known and that we're one with everybody and everything nature will unfold around you to support you unseen beings you know friends strangers the man in the library he might have walked away and thinking what the hell did i say that for you know where did those words come from or he might have just disappeared into the ether you know who knows but um, there's a million stories like that that's made me realize that it's okay to just be who you are today and it's enough do you know um i mean i love that story i've heard that story before because you've shared it on your podcast um and I, I just love it because you became friends with that man, didn't you? Is that that man? Not or... that one. No, there's oh, another God. one. I had another miracle man in the library. Yeah. Um, he disappeared. Never seen him since. Right. Okay. Well, maybe we could touch on him in a bit. But up until that point, you were working at the co-op. You were working in a bed uh, department. And obviously you'd had other jobs before all of that as well. Why do you think it was that time where... Yeah, and you might not have the answer to this, but that you that you were feeling the way that you were feeling was did something trigger it? Was there had there always been a burning desire for you to be self-employed? You know, where where do you think this actually came from? I don't know why it happened specifically at that time, because it took quite a few years for me to take all the stepping stones to the point where I am now. So maybe the invitation comes early and we think, oh my God, it's gonna happen next week. And then we throw our dreams away because actually they're unfolding, but it just takes time. I don't know if, if these kind of promises are like a seed that just needs to germinate in your heart but it's something that I've had in me since I was able to talk. So from a toddler age, my mum said I used to sit and talk to God on my own. And I never thought of myself as being on my own. I'd sit in my room and there was an energy there. And I wouldn't have thought of it as an energy. It was no different to you being there. I just couldn't see it. But I didn't think about not being able to see it. It, it was just a kid thing. You've, you've not got that kind of egocentricity. Like, you know, it's, you just don't think anything's weird because everything's weird. Yeah. Um, but then when I got to about the age of, I'm guessing, I don't know, about seven or eight or something, it disappeared. I remember crying my eyes out and saying to my mum, it's gone. Um, and as an adult, I've looked back on spiritual teachings and it says you get to a certain age where you have to decide to connect with this energy you're given free will whereas as a kid you haven't got that ability it's like it's just there or it was for me and so and from the earliest age I can remember at school so maybe you're like about five or something and people are like what do you want to be when you grow up and I used to say I wanted to be a nun and not because I wanted a harsh life I wanted to be close to God it's like the most obvious thing ever like Santa Claus you know, if that energy felt like pure love, like why would you not want to be around that? And I found it weird as I grew older that other people thought that was weird. So my whole life has been a creeping back to what I experienced as a kid. Yeah. So when you got to that moment where Rita had reached out and then this man, stranger, spoke to you, do you think it was just a case of because of your connection with God or energy or source, whatever you want to call it, do you think it was just a case of that you more than most might have been open to the fact that these are signs that you shouldn't be ignoring? Or do you think there was something else going on? There's times in my life where I sit down and consciously open up. That day 
wasn't one of those times. I've had these kind of experiences before where people go, oh, you must be really sensitive to synchronicity. I'm sure it happens to everyone, but maybe you just notice it more. It, it wasn't one of those times. It was like a sledgehammer. Um, and these kind of sledgehammer times are quite rare. Yeah, so it was like something strong energetically had obviously just slotted into place and this door opened and just sucked me through. I didn't do anything. If anything, I was immobilized that day. I, yeah. can, I can really relate to the sledgehammer analogy because um, I've already shared on previous podcasts about the sledgehammer moment for me. And that was <clears throat> the synchronicities of me ending up in front of a particular acupuncturist who just qualified for a skin problem. And at the end of the introductory sessions that she gave me, she basically said, you know, a lot of people will cut and run at this point um, because I'm not interested in your symptoms. I want to do mind, body, spirit. I want to do the whole thing. And, and uh, you know, are you up for that? And I was like, yeah, I'm up for that because I knew, I knew that there was something that I was holding on to, holding back from, I don't know what it was. And then, um, and she basically said, I just have to tell you, you're deeply unhappy. Mm. And I was just like, I'd, and I've been married a year at this point. And I was like, I'm not. And uh, she said, Mel, I just have to say it as I see it. You're deeply, mm. deeply unhappy. And it felt like that sledgehammer was cracked over my head and the tears just were uncontrollable. So I can totally relate to that. Mm. It was, and that was the start of the rest of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting what you were saying that, you know, it wasn't instant either in terms of the changes that you've made, because, you know, I'm currently, um, embark, you know, launching a, a coaching career. Um, and I've been talking about that probably for about the last three or four years, but like you, I, there was a lot of reasons why you don't do it. You're scared. You're, I was working full time. I, I couldn't give that income up. You know, I was constrained by the bills and and then not having any and, and then not believing in myself and, and also it's the imposter syndrome who am i you know to sit in front of somebody and, and give them a reflection in terms of how they could improve their life or whatever and so you go through all of that don't you every single reason why you shouldn't do something um but again synchronicities of this year you know i ended up on a, a webinar where i was approached to, to be part of this accreditation program. And that happened 24 hours after I'd been told I was being made redundant. So to me, it was like, okay, universe is kicking my ass. It's finally time for me to do it. Mm. And, and that's what I'm doing, you know, and it is scary because I haven't had any income coming in for a few months. Mm. Uh, but, you know, I have every faith that come January, it's gonna start to build, so. Mm yeah so yeah i totally relate to that um so well let's go back to your your other man that you met so would you share that story with us yeah oh that was <laughs> that was beautiful that was another bolder moment where um i went through a very traumatic four months and but again, it was softened by something in me knowing it beforehand. So most people would have said it was tragic. And my mum, who was a psychotherapist, was she's like, this is off the scale. So within four months, my stepdad died almost out of the blue. My mum got to the point where she was having suicidal feelings. And so I was supporting her. And then two months later, my dad died. Um, a lump appeared in my body. So I had to go to the hospital, which caused this huge panic attack in me because I'd just seen two people die in there. Um, I lost a baby. I lost my relationship and I lost my home all within four months. And it, it was just off the scale, some of it I couldn't even process. Um, and for about a year and a half, I, 
I think I just had post-traumatic stress. I struggled even to go to a restaurant. You know, I just, but before all of that happened, I kept having this um, feeling that I was going on a huge journey up a massive mountain. And it was this feeling of excitement. And I said to my mum, I told my partner at the time, I was like, I wonder if I'm actually gonna go somewhere. This is such a weird feeling. And then I had a dream that um, me and my mum walked down her drive together. We held hands, we looked up at the sky. I didn't know why. And then to my right were three pots and one of them had bamboo. I wanted the flowers, but I was told the bamboo was mine. And then I saw a shared house and that was it. The dream went, I wrote it all down. And not long later, months later, maybe three or four months later, that's when my stepdad died. That was the start of the rolling my whole life but getting smashed um and it was then that uh, during my dad's funeral I couldn't actually go to the proper thing for family reasons um my mum and me held a memorial and it was then she through a weird twist of fate we ended up setting off Chinese lanterns which were okay back then at the bottom of her drive. So we walked down her drive holding hands together and looked up at the sky. I dreamt it. And then the house fell through, my relationship fell through. I moved into my boss's spare room. Outside the bedroom was this massive pot of bamboo, massive, like car size. And there was the shared house. And then um, the lady that also shared the house, she turned out to be my best friend. So we stayed together for years. Um, but it was in that time I had this bolder question. I felt like I couldn't function. And the question was, can you live well if you know you're dying? And people were like, well, everyone's dying. You know, like people say that until they actually get a terminal diagnosis. Um, I was like, I feel like this is a, it was like a question that was so deep. I didn't even know where it came from. I needed to know the answer. Can you live well if you know you're dying? And so I went to the library, I just sat in a corner, it was a dead end corner. And I just again felt totally immobilized. And this man walked into my dead end corner and I was like, obviously wasn't dead enough. <laughs> I didn't want company and he didn't seem to notice that. And he was chatting away and he just said, um, you know, I've got quite bad eyesight, can you help me find this book? And he was describing this book. Apparently I was in a poetry section, I didn't even notice. And as he was talking about this poetry and he was so poetic himself, I started to cry, but it was like silent tears just dripping down my face. Eventually he noticed this, kind of looked at me a bit funny and then just kept talking. And then eventually he said to me, you know, who are you and why are you here? And I found myself just telling him. And um, he said, I'm, yeah, I have terminal cancer, um, prostate cancer. And he was telling me about his life. He, he was always very different. He was always a traveler. He was just this utterly unique soul who thought himself very odd. <laughs> but in just, he was an artist and he was living well, even though he knew he was dying. There was no cure for what he had. And we spent about two hours in this corner of the library. He pulled up a chair and we just talked and talked and talked. And I walked out of there with my answer. And it, the answer was, yes, you can. You can live well. Um, you just have to stay true to your heart, which is perhaps the point of this podcast. That again, things aren't always easy. But if you follow the curves of your heart, it's living well. And for him, some days that was being bound in his flat because he couldn't go out because of the state of his body at times. But he would make sure that he stared at the park where he was at. And sometimes he'd go out very late at night and crunch through the snow because it was almost like the witching hour. And it was the time where if something happened, no one else was around, you know, he could look after himself. When he could function, he would take himself off traveling, always on his own. He would send me little relics, like bits of rock from an ancient wall. And 
he couldn't text, like he could receive text, but he would always write an answer on a letter because he didn't know how to text. He was one of these people, just the kind that I get drawn to, I guess. <laughs> so, um, yeah. And I suppose it's like, can you, the question now is, can you live well, full stop? You know, you don't even need to have that feeling of like, oh my God, I'm dying. You know, it's like, can you do that now? Because we all are, you know, we've all got limited time. And I suppose the words were living well. It wasn't just living, it was living well. Yeah. Do you feel that, do you feel that you're ach achieving living well? On the whole, I'm really happy. Um, and I'm learning how to live with the questions, learning how to live with the not knowing, and I'm learning how to live with the hunger. So because I've seen such amazing things spiritually, I get frustrated that I'm not in that place of enlightenment where I know 24 seven that I'm one with everything, that I can ask a question and the universe will respond. I, I live with a feeling of disconnect as well, feelings of fear, feelings of anxiety, and then I'm, my, my head's going like, Amanda, why are you scared about anything after the way things have unfolded for you? You should never fear. You should just have trust. And I get frustrated that I still am disconnected in my head. Um, and things even, you know, there's all sorts of areas of my life where I'm like, why am I still doing this? Or why am I, you know, it, but I'm learning how to live well with those things. My mum always taught me, you know, enjoy the journey. Don't always be trying to get to the destination, otherwise you're gonna miss it. Mm. Um, and that's hard to do sometimes when you know I'm on, you're on a massive journey up a massive mountain and it's gonna be amazing up there. I wanna experience that more. But if all I ever do is be frustrated I'm not up there or I'm constantly trying to push myself to get up there, it, it's not living well. It's something that's not talked about a lot in spirituality. A lot of spirituality is about how to get there, how to do more, how to be more. And then the other half is just about how to be and they're not worried about what to do. And there's a delicate balance between the two that I'm constantly feeling into. How do I live well today? Yeah, in that balance between doing and non-doing. Yeah, um, I, I can totally relate and I'm sure people listening can as well because if I think about like autobiographies of rock stars, film stars or whatever, they all say the journey was much more interesting than the destination because when they finally arrived, it was like, oh, right, is this it? You know, <laughs> um, and there was always a lot more fun in trying to get there than, than actually being there because obviously certainly in that world, you're then governed by the corporate suits and God knows what. So it must be, must be horrendous. Um, but if I sort of bring us back to our, um, our realm, not the, not the stardom realm, it, I, I totally get what you're saying because I'm, I, I'm the big, one of the biggest ones, certainly have been in the past. I'm getting a lot better at beating myself up for not being there, wherever there is. You know, I've been, I've wanted to be a millionaire since about the age of, I don't know, 27, something like that. Um, I had a lot of things driving me back then in terms of wanting to look after my mum and dad because they, they weren't financially sorted and, and the rest of my family. Um, but also, not, you know, wanting to be able to, um, you know, go and do whatever I wanted to do in the world and, and money wouldn't be an object. That was really what was driving it. Um, and also being able to help people. But, and I've got frustrated over the years with, with, I'm still not there. I've still cocked it up. I've still made more mistakes. How have I made the same mistakes again? You know, and, and all of that. And, and I think on the last journey, uh, sorry, the, um, the last sort of 10 years or so, um, well, really when I lost my dad, which was um, 14 years ago, that was the start for me of the real spiritual journey. I was raised a Catholic, but never ever related to the Catholic religion. Um, and I even wrote a song called Twisted Lie 
which is about the Bible. So I always knew that it was, you know, it wasn't right. Um, spirituality is definitely where I'm at. And I think that pivotal moment with the acupuncturist was the start of the rest of my life because I realized I was in a marriage I shouldn't have been in. That was no great revelation, but to actually, to actually have somebody else recognize it in me was, was a revelation, I think. Um, and then since then, I've been on this journey of probably self-discovery, true purpose. Um, I was in the spiritual closet for a long time. Rita helped me step out of that. Um, and, and as she's moved to Lincolnshire, which was two or three years ago now, you've stepped in. So I, I feel like you're my spiritual teacher as well. Um, but I'm happy. I'm loud and proud now about spirituality. But a few years ago when I was the corporate, you know, whatever, um, it didn't fit right. It didn't seem right. It didn't seem like the two could marry up. So it, it is a whole journey. And, and ev every day, you know, you, you never, there is never an end game. There is never an end destination because the day you stop growing and learning is the day you die, in, in my humble uh, opinion. Um, and what I've, some of the stuff I've been hearing you say recently about energy in the body and being, you know, just being with things, that's very much similar to what I'm also experiencing in other places where I'm listening to people and, you know, um, spiritual groups and, and different leaders and uh, also doing energy work um, whereby people spend so much money on counseling and therapy and get nowhere. And very often it makes the matters, makes matters worse because all of a sudden they can remember something that they'd locked away and they, they really didn't want to remember it because it's just made the whole memory of that childhood 10 times worse. Whereas if you can stop trying to remember all the bad shit and actually just go to just back into our body because I know you've been talking about this and actually you can actually feel where the energy is and if you if you can just sit with it it will eventually dissipate um like emotions you know we're a, we're on a constant roller coaster of emotions aren't we and one day we might feel elated the next day we might be wanting to slit our wrists and it doesn't make us a good or a bad person it just makes us a person we are spiritual beings having a human experience at the end of the day but we're not taught this. We're not taught that the energy in our body, you know, that is essentially what it is. We are all just energy anyway, right? So, um, and if you can just be with it without judgment and then just let it dissipate because emotions come and go, feelings come and go. Um, I didn't mean to waffle on that long about that. Sorry about that. But um, just you inspired me to, to say that because... I have noticed a lot of the things you've been saying recently is relating to other things that I'm involved with and, and have been part of. Um, and it feels like there is a collective rising, you know, there's, there's more and more people that are beginning to feel that and want to feel that. And if more people were, were aware of how, how easy it is, actually, it is easy. If you just allow yourself to be and allow the energy to move, you can, you can just be, be. If you can just be. Yeah. Yep. Love it. <laughs> I'm just thinking you'd make a great yoga teacher. <laughs> Those are my honest thoughts. <laughs> no, I, t I love yoga, as you know. Um, but I don't, I don't, I just don't feel pulled to teach. Um, but I don't feel pulled to teach today. That could be different, you know. Yeah. Next month, who knows? But <laughs> or an energy facilitator. <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, I, I'm Reiki, Reiki too, the same as you. I mean, I keep thinking about doing Reiki, the Reiki master, being a Reiki master, but I'm like, why? Because I know you haven't gone on to that. No, not yet. However, there are quite a lot of Reiki people all starting to rise up and want to come together. Okay. To form a group. And um, I keep wondering, do I want to be the facilitator of that? I wonder if you'd be good. Anyway, we'll have a chat afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> you hold space really lovely, really nice holding. Yeah. I do want to do more with Reiki. Um, you know, I, I self 
heal and I do it for friends and my partner Matt I mean he is he is an engineer and very left-brained so this whole world to him is is different but he's open to it and I've given him Reiki about three or four times and he's just like I don't know what you're doing he said but it's just unbelievable he said <laughs> you know and I'm like he says he says you're so you're so powerful. And I'm like, it, it isn't me. I'm just a conduit. You know, I'm just a conduit for the energy at the end of the day. Um, and, but it's great that he feels it. You know, he's, I've been able to just, he just, he's gone. He's asleep. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he loves it. Yeah. It's an amazing practice. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> What's next for you, do you think? Because obviously COVID has thrown you from um, all of us being together in classes to having to all be doing yoga from home and you're in your home, which has been great. And I think it's certainly, I mean, you've just flourished in it. You know, I've, I, I had another yoga teacher, which um, she's done online as well, but just, just not as good as you, I um, have to say. Um, and I and now you're doing more classes, then I, I'd be more in, inclined to do your classes because I just really enjoy what you do, whether it's soft or a bit more energetic or whatever. So you've already changed your world this year. So, and I I I think you can do so much more. But what what's what's next for you? Where do you think you want to go next? If there is a next, uh, my dream. My dream eventually is to have some kind of a retreat or be part of it. What I want is a spiritual community. So at this time in life, I feel like I'm being called home. And before lockdown happened, almost a, exactly a year before, I started getting the words about coming home. And I told my yoga teacher, I feel like, life is calling me to come home literally to my physical home and on a deeper level and then a year later we laughed that this kept going on throughout the year i was like what does it even mean and then we were all locked in and so immediately all these other yoga teachers were panicking and i was like this is it this is what i've been prepared for for a year um and it's amazing. I need it. I need a bit more time within this space of home because when you work in studios, the pay is so bad. Yeah. You could have 40 people there and you're paid 20, 21 pounds an hour. Right. Um, you know, a yoga studio could be charging people nine pounds or 10 pounds to get in and they'll be paying you 18, even though the room is full and they're all your students. So with the odd stranger coming in, um, it's not, it's just not viable financially you end up rushing here there and everywhere and so being locked in suddenly I could charge people a lot less offer them what I felt people were needing and earning a decent income and being at home so I can start to really plug into my spiritual life as well which I felt was starting to get a bit threadbare at times with rushing from studio to studio and getting one day off a week and um yeah so at the moment home is right you've spoken to me about it before that i need to start to build on my stories my stories are they're never gonna leave they're my treasure they're in there but i think i feel like a grace baby so whenever i try to do something before the right time it's stress mm. and then when the right time comes it's like the door just opens and I just waltz through like wow what was the stress so I'm learning like when is the right time but you, you know you will I'm sure you're going to be an amazing coach because you're more yang than me you're like well how you know what's the steps blah 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 blah, blah. I feel like a real yin baby so in yoga yin is like more passive more feminine and more allowing and it's not balanced in itself you need the yang you need the active you need the how you need the left range you need the list otherwise you end up too wishy-washy mm. um 
but until I have more of that yang in my life, I'm really trusting the yin of when is the right time and tr really trusting that. And at the moment, I'm just home. I'm just teaching my stuff from home. I keep thinking, gosh, I could be doing workshops. I could be doing this. I could be doing that. But right now, like everything is calling me towards slowing down and noticing all the little things, like getting more mindful. And the more that I do that, the more I'm connecting with something bigger. Like I'm feeling things for people on certain days, messaging them, and that's exactly what they're going through. And there was no way that I could know that. It's like this energy is pouring through me. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you do that I'm actually, all the time, don't you? Yeah, yeah. But having the time to actually it's almost like as I slow down, I become like a sponge and I soak in everything, you know, nature, the plants, the quality of light, people's energy. And it's not just soaks in, it also kind of goes back out again. So people and things are blessed. I feel like a stained glass window where, like you said at the start, you're like, well, I'm nothing. But the light that comes through is everything. And if that window is clean and clear, which to me sometimes just means slowing down, resting, or what you said, just be a little bit more, which some people are like, oh, okay, I've got to go from, you know, running around a hundred miles an hour to suddenly getting on my mat and then expect to be zen. Or sometimes it means sit down, have a coffee, or read a book, or talk to your partner, or go for a walk, or jog, or whatever, and allow the energy to kind of slow down in whatever way works for you and then eventually you can get to that place where you start to feel um you've got enough room that you can actually take something in that's beyond you so hopefully after all of this home time whatever the universe is doing in me i'm hoping to start to embrace my stories more but also community and and weave in stuff to do with nature which all of it together and art and creativity speaks um, retreat for me. Yeah. Well, that all sounds wonderful. And of course we, we don't know what's gonna happen over the next few months, do we, in terms of lockdown and everything. But I, I feel the same as you. I feel like, like my son the other day said he doesn't recognize me at the moment. And that, that's for a few reasons. We, we had a falling out. But he left um, last year to move to London. He got a job with Google and he moved out in October. And then because of lockdown, he came home, I think it was middle of March. And of course, he's been home ever since because Google closed their offices and apparently they're going to be closed till June, which I just think is crazy. But anyway, and um, so when he left for London, I was in my corporate job racing around like an idiot um doing stuff <clears throat> doing stuff in the evenings um i've always been doing other things trying to make money other ways so i could try and quit the job and um yeah and and since and then of course i got made redundant in uh, june and i just went on a complete stop i mean we had a wonderful summer so i spent a lot of time in the garden to begin with and, um, and then this coaching thing has taken a bit longer to get through the accreditation and it, they're sort of building it as they fly it really. Um, and that's all taken. So through all that slowness, I've been slow and he, he just can't, he's like, who are you? <laughs> you know, also, cause of them, um, obviously what is going on with COVID there's, there's a lot of conspiracy theories that are going around and I, you know, I don't call it conspiracy. I call it truth seeking because I am one of those people. And to be fair, that completely consumed me for quite a while. And he doesn't want to know about it. He's in his own zone. And, and I've learned over the last sort of month or so, I need to get out. I, I need to, I think I said this to you. Was it you on the text the other day? about raising the vibration. Yeah. Um, so I know that that's something that I'm actively conscious of and, and not wanting to get sucked into the darkness of it all. Um, but yeah, he was just, I, I, I think I've lost where, why I started this conversation, but he literally said he didn't recognize me mm. or doesn't recognize me at the moment. And, um, 
and I try to, I, I said to him, I am no different, you know. Yes, okay, I've got strong views on, on what might be happening in the world right now. Um, but I'm still me, you know. Um, but I suppose, I think, I think all my family are thinking that actually, let's be honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you have to follow your truth. And for me, what, and I, I almost, I think I said to my mum the other day, I think I was Bodhisattva in a previous life or Boudicca, however you want to pronounce it. And she just laughed and she said, you probably were Mel, because I feel like um, there is such injustice in the world and it's only, and there is a collective awakening that's happening at the moment around the globe. And there's a lot of people standing up and talking their truth and what they see as the truth. And I think, I think we're in for whatever, but this whole slowing down and we're heading towards December the 21st, which is a solstice and the December the 21st, 2020 is supposed to be crucial, just crucial for um, higher consciousness rising up and um, going into the fifth dimension, which apparently we were in the fifth dimension a long time ago and something changed to put us down into 3D, but that's a whole other podcast. Um, so I don't think it's I don't think it's weird that I'm slowing down because I feel like everyone, I mean, this whole lockdown has slowed people down. And I think a lot of people have enjoyed it more than they expected to because they got more time, like you said, you know, you're not racing around chasing your tail. You've got more time with the family, um, more time with nature, more time in the garden. I know some people have really struggled. Um, and I feel, I really feel for the people, you know, that are in a high rise flat and, and, no garden and all that sort of stuff you know when we first went into lockdown um but i think you know on balance i think it is a time for reflection and slowing down and i don't think that's a bad thing mm. um it can make you feel a little lost mm. and it is scary and it is weird but at the same time i think it's essential and necessary to be able to then start again in the new capacity in the new version if there is such a thing yeah I agree and some people are having their breakdowns in this time you know I've got students whose marriages are breaking down jobs are breaking down there's been all sorts going on one lady's having to move out of her house without another job and but I know from when I was everything caved in for me and that voice was like you're on a massive journey up a really big mountain but sometimes what we call tragedy can be a door and it's not that I'd go around saying you know I wish this on anyone else I don't wish any suffering at all but my teacher he talks a lot about the hero's journey and sometimes in spirituality, it can be all love and light and they don't embrace the shadows and the, po the whole point of having shadows and challenges is that, you know, it, it's a huge part of growth. Um, and it almost seems essential. I don't understand it, but I do like the idea of being on a hero's journey because then when you do go through stuff that you're struggling to cope with and everything's a mess, um, it doesn't mean that you've done something wrong. Or even if you have done something wrong on the outside and it's created this huge mess, it doesn't mean that your whole life is wrong. Um, it's, it's, I see it in nature all the time that everything is valuable. And you see it in these native cultures, they use everything. Um, yeah, I love when the leaves fall off the trees and they just cover the base of the tree and keep the roots warm and feed it. And yet we we're like when things die or fall away, we think it's a mess or, you know, shameful or I want yoga and more spirituality to start going down that road in five rhythms. They dance, one of the rhythms that they dance is chaos. You know, they dance chaos. They feel the energy and they like you were saying when you just be it's like allow it to come through you and process and go where it needs to go um 
yeah it's really interesting i can't remember why i said any of that <laughs> well we were talking about the slowness of everything right now and and just letting it be um and the, you know the, the chaos that people are some people are going through yeah um okay well i just have to say like all through this interview there's like this like somebody's tickling my head so um i'm guessing that's something to do with your energy but um <laughs> Um, okay, well, it, as we sort of draw to a close, I always like to finish with, um, in, in, in view of our listeners listening, if there's, if there's anybody that's listening to this podcast that is intrigued and, but also wants to change something for themselves, perhaps is scared or doesn't quite know how to start or maybe doesn't even know what it is, but feels like there's something, you know, if you could give any words of wisdom to somebody that sort of sat there in the, in the early stages or, or maybe about to take a leap or whatever, what, what would you like to say to them? My instinctive word was trust. And I think maybe from my unique perspective as a yoga teacher, I would try to draw you into a place of comfort. So even though you're at the stage where, you know, you're either feeling that you need to make a change or you need to make a leap, that can be a really strong energy and trust that that is gonna happen. Sometimes what we neglect in these times is, is also wrapping ourselves up. So often you take a leap from a foundation that is solid. You know, if your foundation is really shifting, like if you try to jump off sand, it's hard. So go against your instincts um, and just embrace all of the comfort you can as well. Even if it's just little things like cups of tea or your favorite book or spending time with a friend. Because often when we come to these times where we're having to make a leap, we just tend to dwell in the edgy places of reading all the stuff that's going to bring more change or how can I get there quicker or da, 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 and we end up swinging into a place of imbalance. There's something in me that feels also like a mother and yoga is all about balance. So I would try to bring you into a place where you're also dwelling into a place of trust, which if you're truly trusting, then something in you accepts comfort allows yourself to be um, in a place where you're receiving and being held um, and just trust that whatever needs to grow will grow like the seed rests in the soil it's held in the warmth of the soil it's not moving around whatever inside of it is going to burst out so whatever is inside of you is going to burst out but let yourself be held receive any comfort that's around you and don't feel like you're slowing the process down mm. by doing comforting things because it's not it's so important it helps you to enjoy the journey i wish someone had taught me that because so often when you start your spiritual journey all you're doing is trying to grow just chucking all this food in your mouth all the time all these books all these things all this da, 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 da. nobody tells you to be comfortable um Imagine seed growing from that kind of stress. Yeah. So it's a bit of a weird message, but I feel like I have a bit of a, a unique message in the world. So it's not weird at all. Um, I just wanted to show you that the people on the podcast. Ah, yeah. <laughs> the people listening to this won't be able to see what I've just shown, but when I share the video, they will. I actually made that at Rita's retreat. Um yeah trust always basically and that reminds me i don't know if you've ever read uh, the surrender experiment by michael yes Sitt. he is incredible it is like that's in one of my top five um, yeah. so i would definitely recommend anybody to read that book um yeah. that is exactly what it's all about it's surrender and trust and what will be will be and yeah it you, what you think you want the universe has got bigger and better ideas for you if you're only open to it, you know, and, and you allow yourself to be guided in the right way. So now that's beautiful. And I, I love what you said there about 
even though you, you feel like you've slow, you know, you're t- having a cup of tea, you're doing this, you're doing this, you're creating all of this stuff to make you feel in balance, but you feel like you're holding yourself back. Cause I do that quite a lot. I feel like I should be do, 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 do. Um, and, and, and I think my son probably thinks I should be do, 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 do. <laughs> That's what he's used to. So it's quite hard for him to adjust, but, um, yeah, it's, yeah, just be calm and, and, you know, like this coaching thing, as I said, it, it got presented to me, it got handed in my lap and I'm working with some amazing people that are giving me the confidence and the framework to take this out to the masses. And wow, I, you know, a few months ago, that wasn't even in my radar. Mm. I couldn't have dreamt that up myself. Yeah. You know? So, um, yeah, amazing. Amanda, beautiful. I knew I was gonna I knew I was gonna love this hour with you. It's <laughs> been really nice. <laughs> <laughs> if people want to find out a little bit more about you, um, where could they go and find you online? Have you got a website, Instagram, things like that? Yeah, so it's my website is www.intoyoga. So that's I-N-T-U-Y-O-G-A. So intoyoga.com. Um, and if you prefer, you know, you're not internet at all, you can just get in touch with Mel and um, she can give you my phone number. I put my phone number on business cards. It's not a problem. Um, and I'm on Facebook under Amanda Pebbody. I'm doing some stupid yoga pose on a beach. <laughs> and I'm on Instagram. I think my name is Firefly Moongazer or something equally hippie. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, I can put that in the show notes as well. So uh, I'll make sure I've got that right. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you again. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I love being in your space. I always feel like I'm zened out afterwards. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been lovely. Take care, darling. Mm-hmm.